Greetings, everyone. All right, so when we come back from Easter break, or spring break, we're going to have to deal with vectors. And as I've told you or alluded to before, the vectors that we're going to have to deal with are not the same as we had to deal with pre calc Although everything we're going to talk about still applies there. What we're going to talk about um, here, specifically in, in Calc BC, pertains to the analogous stuff that we did with single uh, variable calculus, or rather, one-dimensional calculus back in Calc AB, where things were moving just along a line. And so that's why I'm calling this motion along a line review, so that when we come back together to, to talk about the vector stuff, motion in two dimensions, we'll be able to make the analogous jump from one dimension just moving along a line, uh, and hope, hopefully rather easily. So let's get right into this. So, motion along a line. So everything we talked about last year, um, and still have done and dealt with this year, has been an object moving back and forth along a line. So if we had an object moving side to side, it's moving back you know, and forth along, say, the x-axis. And you'd see me walk back and forth in front of you and, and ask you questions. And the position function, s of t, that we were given always described where the object was in relation to, say, the origin or some other starting point as it moved back and forth in regards to time. We also talked a lot about vertical motion. So we had objects being thrown upward or dropped, you know. And again, but it was just motion along the line. It wasn't projected outward at an angle to the ground. It was straight up or straight down. And so it was always one-dimensional motion, just motion along a line. And so, again, the position function always just dictated to us where the object was at some, some time in regards to a starting point or some fixed point for reference. You know, uh, sometimes the origin or sometimes not the origin. It doesn't really matter. Um, just it, it denoted a relationship from measuring a dis directed distance from where it started. And what we're going to do here is review those uh, relationships that we talked about and then hopefully make the jump to two dimensions much more easily because we remember this stuff well. And so the first basic thing that we should remember is just, and, and we, we use it so much it's probably second nature now, if S of T is our position function, which gives us the directed distance the object is from some starting point or from some fixed point, um, meaning that the S of T values could be positive or they could be negative, depending on where the object is. Negative uh, values gave a certain distance, maybe to the left or down below, or you know, positive to the right or above, uh, depending if it was vertical or horizontal motion. But we could also we could also flip that around depending on how we wanted to de define things. But nonetheless, S of T had, could be positive, could be negative. And the sign, positive or negative sign, could be, uh, or definitely would indicate direction for us. Then, of course, if we wanted the velocity function, the velocity function was found by just taking the derivative of the position function. And I'm not going to go through why that is. We went, we went through that last year, and you should have notes on that. But we set up the derivative, and we look at the you know, instantaneous rate of change of the position function with respect to time. The, you know, that works out to be the velocity. And then we had our acceleration function, a of t, which happened to be the first derivative of the velocity function or the second derivative of the position function. Now, something we're not going to really do much with in uh, two dimensions is jerk, but just to remind us of that, if I can squeeze it all on here, um, we all remember that jerk was the first derivative of acceleration, or the second derivative of the velocity function, or the third derivative of the uh, position function, although that's something, again, we're not going to be dealing with here in two dimensions with vectors. So this is the relationship, you know, moving downward, we get that, we get moving downward by taking derivatives, but we can move upward by taking antiderivatives, something that we did uh, dealt with last year. So if I take the antiderivative of the acceleration function, I would get a velocity function. You know, I've got to remember to use the plus c and whatnot. Uh, and then if I take the antiderivative of velocity, I would get the position function. All these relationships are going to hold true in uh, two dimensions when we deal with vectors as well, or even ex uh, three dimensions, which we're not going to deal with um, necessarily. But it's 
this stuff is extendable to more, more than two dimensions. So this is the first relationship that we have to remember, just moving between the different functions. If we have one, we know how to get to the others by either taking a derivative or an antiderivative. Now, another thing we worked on last year was determining proper language for talking about motion. And myself included, but we all get lazy about how we converse or talk with somebody about how something's moving. And we do so in this sense. We often interchange the words speed and velocity. And those words, scientifically, mathematically, aren't equal to each other. They're not, they're not exactly the same thing. They're certainly related to each other, but they are not the same thing. And so when we are wanting to speak precisely about a, you know, the motion of an object, we should distinguish whether we're talking about speed or velocity properly by using the word properly in uh, the context of how we're using it. And so the relationship that we hopefully remember is that speed is the absolute value of velocity. Let's talk about that just a moment. Velocity is a vector. Even in one dimension, it is still a vector. Vectors, without giving you the, a full uh, detailed definition of it, uh, in, in a sense, vectors are uh, ways of stating information, a number, let's say, or a quantity, that gives you two pieces along, in that quant uh, along with that quantity, a magnitude and a direction, a how much and in what direction. That's the magnitude part is the how much. And so if I say an object is moving at 30 miles per hour, then the magnitude of that 30 miles per hour is the speed, and the magnitude of 30 is 30, so the speed is also 30 miles per hour. But there's direction associated with the velocity, and because I set it as a positive number in our usual convention, positive being to the right, then we would say that the object is traveling at 30 miles per hour to the right. And so the number itself, the fact that it was positive, gave us information about where, or rather the direction in which it was traveling, and the size of the number, the magnitude of 30, also being 30, gave us the how much, the speed part of it. So when we state something in terms of velocity, we are given two pieces of information. We're given the speed and the direction. If I say that the velocity was negative 10 feet per second, then the, the negative 10 would give us an indication of direction again, possibly to the left or possibly downward, depending on what the, the direction of the motion is, horizontal or vertical. Um, but let's say, let's say it was just to stick to the horizontal. So negative 10 feet per second, which would be moving to the left, and the, the left is the direction because it's negative, and then the magnitude of negative 10 is 10, so the speed would be 10. And so even in one dimension, we're still given two pieces of information from velocity. It gives us the speed as the magnitude, and it gives us the direction as the sign. Now, when we get to two-dimensional motion, the same relationship is still going to hold. Velocity is still going to give us two pieces of information, but those two pieces of information will not be uh, as easy to pull out necessarily as in one dimension. The direction will take some calculation, and we did that sort of thing back in pre-cal, whether you liked it or not and whether you remembered it, remember it or not. We did that. But when we're in two dimensions, when we're asked to find speed, we're asked to find magnitude of velocity. And we'll work on that in two dimensions, because finding that magnitude isn't going to be that hard. Um, but we'll, we'll go over that on, uh, when we come back, and we'll, we'll show you how to deal with that. But this relationship is still true, and that's what I want you to remember and carry with you into class when we talk about this. That speed is the magnitude of velocity. We just got to now figure out how to find the magnitude of a vector in two dimensions or more. And you may remember that from pre-cal and you may not, but we definitely will talk about it next time. We also talked about the issue of speeding up and slowing down. So you may or may not recall this, speeding up or slowing down. I hope you recall it, but if you don't, let's remind ourselves. <clears throat> We, we determined whether or not the object was speeding up or slowing down based on the direction of the acceleration and velocity expressions uh, for that particular object at the particular moment. 
So if the velocity of an object was pointing to the right and the acceleration was also pointing to the right, then they're pointing in the same direction and the acceleration is acting to change the velocity in that direction and um, in an increasing way because it's pointing in the same direction. And so this is the speeding up case. Or this is an example of a speeding up case. Speeding up that looks terrible, but you guys know my writing is not always great. And the way we, when the another way we classified this was that in this case here, the velocity is positive and the acceleration is positive. In other words, they have the same sign, and so the object is increasing its speed, increasing its magnitude of its velocity. Now, if uh, we had the velocity point in this direction, and I'm already using vector notation here, and the acceleration is also pointing in that direction, well again, the acceleration is acting on the object to increase the magnitude of the velocity. So this is also a speeding up case because the velocity and the acceleration are both negative. Okay, And so they have the same sign. sign and so we have the speeding up case happening again. Now when the object is moving in such a way that the velocity is pointing in one direction but the acceleration is pointing in the opposite direction then the object is slowing down. Then the, the acceleration is acting on the velocity to change the velocity. Let me put a barrier between these two but they're related. The acceleration is acting on the velocity to reduce the magnitude of the velocity and so the object is going to be slowing down. And so if we get something like this where here we have the velocity is greater than zero and the acceleration is less than zero or the velocity is less than zero and the acceleration is greater than zero. This is the uh, slowing down case because in either case here what we have is the, uh, the acceleration and velocity pointing in opposite directions. So we dealt with that last year, slowing down. And so we're going to deal with that in two dimensions uh, with vectors. We're not going to be able to say as simply as they're going in opposite directions, so they have the opposite signs. But there will be a way for us to, to use this idea and extend it to two dimensions so that we'll be able to understand exactly how this works in two dimensions. And it'll be a fairly simple test, and I'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, just going to take a little bit of insight. All right, continuing on here. One other uh, relationship that we found that we used quite a bit and we still use is how do we calculate the displacement of an object? How do we calculate the total distance over which an object travels on some interval? And so we did this um, through a couple different ways. Um, very simply, displacement on the interval from A to B if we know the position function, it's s of b minus s of a, the final position minus the initial position. We're just changing position. So we would calculate that using that. Total distance was a little bit more tricky um, with, uh, for, for which to calculate. And so I'll try to write a brief note on that. Or I'll just try to give a brief algebraic description of that. It would be something like this, where we would calculate the magnitude of s of c sub 1 minus s of a plus the magnitude of c sub 2, s of c sub 2, excuse me, minus s of c sub 1 to calculate the magnitude of this. And then we continue this all the way down until we get to the last point at which the object changes direction. C sub n, oops, actually, that should be a b. The very last one should be s of b minus s of c sub n. What, what we're doing here is the object is just changing direction at all the c sub i's, okay? Where c sub i is a point 
or actually a time would be a better way of putting it because those are time values, is a time when the velocity v of t changes sign or the object changes direction. And so every time the object changes direction, I mark the point where it changes direction and I look to the previous point and I take the displacement on that interval because this represents a displacement from, C sub, from A to C sub 1. And then just take the magnitude of that because displacement can be negative. And so I don't want um, negative uh, displacements or quantities when I calculate total distance. So I take the magnitude. And then I look at the next interval and calculate the displacement on that one. Take its magnitude. And I continue to do this over and over again every time the object changes direction until the very last time. And then I take the magnitude of that displacement. And then I just add all those together. And that would give us total distance. That's if we knew the position function, though. If we didn't know the position function, our way of calculating total distance and displacement was a little bit different. It was related to a process, but suppose we knew V of T, and if we knew V of T, the displacement was calculated, let's put the interval here, on AB as the definite integral from A to B of the velocity function <clears throat> with respect to time. And that was, you know, quite simple. Sometimes they would give us, um, if we were given a complicated enough function where we couldn't find the antiderivative by hand, or maybe not, couldn't find it easily, we could just set this integral up and calculate that on the calculator. And that would be very easy, very easy to do, okay? Now, total distance was also just about as equally easy if we had to use the calculator. Total distance on the interval from A to B... This was the integral from A to B of the magnitude of the velocity with respect to time. Now, this was a little bit more complicated to do because if we would, if the object would change direction, we'd have to break this up in intervals kind of like we did in, you know, what I just gave you in that previous definition over here. Break it up in intervals and calculate displacements on each of those intervals, take magnitudes. We'd still have to do the same thing here if we had to do it by hand. But if we didn't have to do it by hand, we just plug that in the calculator and get the answer. And the nice thing about each of these equations here, these relationships, is this holds up even in higher dimensions. Let me point something out here. This quantity, the magnitude of velocity, as we just talked about a few moments ago, is the speed. And so the total distance is found by integrating the speed of the object on the interval from A to B with respect to time. That's going to hold up in two dimensions. That's a, nice, that's a very nice relationship that's going to allow us to uh, find an object, find the total distance an object travels in two dimensions just by integrating its speed. Now we're going to have to understand how to calculate speed, and we're going to figure that relationship out, and we're going to relate it back to stuff we've uh, talked about. Uh, but if you remember this relationship as the foundation, the stuff in two dimensions is going to be much easier to understand and grasp. The last thing I want to remind you about um, is something that you just read about in the parametric equations uh, material that I gave you, the hangouts that I gave you, and that was how do you find arc length, okay? Arc length in parametric form is the integral from A to B of the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared and then with respect to time. The reason why I'm pointing this out is this is going to have a direct relationship for us when we are talking about the motion of an object in two dimensions. In fact, if you're clever enough, maybe, um, you think about the velocity function in terms of well, I don't want to give too much away right now, but if you think about this, this relationship here, you're going to see this directly come up in something we just talked about a few moments ago. Um, I don't want to give too much away. We'll talk about it on Monday, but if you think carefully about this, think of the velocity um, vector as an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. Um, 
still as the derivative of the position function, this will make a lot of sense and the connections will be there. So, But think about that, and if you can recognize it while we're going through the lecture next time, uh, that'd be great. And if not, I'll make sure that you see it and be able to use it and understand it and make connections. So hopefully this video made sense and reminds you of stuff that you should have known. If it was confusing, leave me a note um, on Edmodo and we can try to make clarifications before the week is out and before we come back together on Monday. And study.